Welcome back to the Native Waters on Aired Lands podcast, where we're talking with different members of our research team about their work. This is Kelsey Fitzgerald, and today I'm here with Dr. Michael Dettinger, who's a senior research hydrologist for the U.S. Geological Survey, a resident scientist at the University of Nevada, Reno, a research associate of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and also adjunct faculty with the Desert Research Institute here in Reno. In today's episode of the podcast, Mike is going to tell us a little bit about how climate has changed in the Great Basin and American Southwest in the past, and also about some climate projections that he's put together for selected reservations in the Native Waters Study Area for the future. If you're interested in taking a look at any of those projections or checking out some of the climate graphs and other visuals that go along with this episode, you can find them on our website at nativewaters-airlands.com. Hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Can you start off by telling us a little bit about your background and area of expertise? Sure. So I've got about 35 years of experience doing studies of water resources and climates at the Western United States, almost entirely with the USGS. I have a PhD in atmospheric sciences, uh, specializing in climate dynamics from UCLA. But prior to that, I had done master's degrees in water resources from MIT and undergraduate in physics at UC San Diego. And where that all put me was such that my area of expertise kind of lies firmly in between hydrology and climate issues. So I worry a lot about the hydrology of the West but I tend to do it at large scales and in the context of what the climate variations and change are doing out here in the West. Great, and can you tell us a little bit about your role in the Native Waters Project? On the Native Waters Project, I'm sort of a utility person is the way I always view myself. On the team, I tend to be a person that tries to provide climate information, climate data that can be used by the project as a whole and by the tribes that we interact with, as well as providing climate change projections into the future so that we can see whether or not the things that we're trying to figure out about waters today are going to be still applicable in the future. So, Mike, first I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about the past and how climate conditions that we're experiencing today in the Great Basin and Southwest compare with the conditions that have occurred here over the past few thousand years. And then I'd like to ask you a few questions about the future and what your climate change projections tell us about what's next for tribal reservations in the Southwest. As far as temperature, how do the temperatures that we're experiencing right now compare to the temperature conditions that we see in the Paleo record? Over the past thousands of years, there have been large temperature variations that we can reconstruct from tree rings and from stalagmites in caves and from a number of paleoclimatic data sources. As we look at those, it provides a context for thinking about where we are right now and about what projections into the future mean. And when we do look at them, What we see is our temperatures today in the Great Basin are quite a bit warmer, arguably a a half a degree to a degree warmer than they were in the past several thousand years. We have to go back about 8,000 years before we start seeing temperatures that might have been like today. And then if we push back still further to about 12 to 15,000 years ago, we actually go into an ice age and temperatures are much, much cooler and such that Ultimately, we have to push clear through that ice age out the backside into the deep past more than tens of thousands of years ago before we start to see uh, temperatures anything like what we see today. You just mentioned that temperatures in the Great Basin right now are half a degree to a degree warmer than they have been in the past several thousand years. Why is that a concern? When I talk about a half a degree warmer or a degree warmer, it doesn't seem like that big a deal. But an analog that I've seen used or heard used by my colleague, actually Kim Prather at Scripps, often uses it, is to think about the temperature of your kid. If your kid has a temperature of 98.6, everything's groovy. If that temperature rises to 100 degrees, 
you start to really wonder what's going on. And if it rises just one more degree, 101, then you're probably calling up a doctor or you know seriously starting to get worried. That's the range of temperatures that we face in terms of long-term climate variations. And even though the temperature variations don't seem large in the context of the southwest climate system as a whole or of a human body, they matter a lot. The temperatures in the southwest end up mattering in terms of snowpack, whether we get a snowpack or don't, how much evaporation we have, all sorts of things like that. And so basically all of this wraps around to, to say that right now we're sitting at temperatures that are warmer than anything we've probably seen in the past eight to 10,000 years. And they're warm enough that they're a considerable concern already. What do we know about the mega droughts that have occurred in the Southwest in the past and how do these compare to the drought that we've recently experienced? These are the really frightening thing. But in terms of precipitation, there are these things called mega droughts in the paleo record in the distant past that are really terrifying. They're you know, much beyond anything that we see today. And so to describe them, basically when we talk about a mega drought, we're talking about a serious and sustained drought that often will persist for anywhere from 60 to 120 years. And in particular, when I say 60 to 120 years, I'm thinking about a couple of the major mega droughts that are found in tree ring records and the like for the Southwest that occurred in the vicinity of about 1200 AD and another one, a longer one that actually occurred sort of straddling 1000 AD. And these are droughts that depends on where you are, how severe they are, but in some places there have been estimates that these things involved reductions in precipitation overall that were on the order of 15 to 20 percent or more. And that's 15 or 20 percent decline in precipitation that lasts for decades and decades. By comparison, the recent drought here in Northern California, Northern Nevada, we were looking at numbers that were around 25 percent to maybe 30 percent in any given year during that drought. These things are like that, maybe a little bit less intense than individual years in the recent drought but they continue for decades. These things, we don't know what causes them really. If you look at the literature, some people have ideas, but honestly, there's no consensus as to what causes them. Frankly, we don't know how to recognize them when they start. If we were to find ourselves in one, it would be a very long time before we could really say, you know, actually this is this has lasted long enough that it's a mega drought. These occur sporadically all through the paleo reconstructions, the tree ring reconstructions of precipitation and of the combination of temperature and precipitation as we look back over the past you know, several thousand years. We really don't have tree rings that go back much further than that. But even in what, in terms of geologic time, is a short period, several thousand years, we see multiple events like this. And there's nothing particularly about the climate today or about the climate changes we're projecting that would suggest that these can't happen again virtually any time. So when we were in the uh, recent four or five year drought here in northern Nevada, certainly there were people who said, hey, this could be the beginning of a mega drought. And although many of us tended to say, look, let's not get panicky yet, there was really no argument we could make to, that precluded the possibility that that would have been the beginning of a mega drought. So that's the nature of these things. And how about carbon dioxide? How do the carbon dioxide levels of today compare to what we've seen over the past few thousand years? In terms of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, and carbon dioxide is the principal 
greenhouse gas that we pay attention to. It's the one that humans are putting the most of into the atmosphere and that lasts the longest. Today, we have about 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere. Over the past 10,000 years, the levels were pretty much always in the vicinity of about 280 parts per million. And when I say in the vicinity, I mean that they really didn't swing much above or much below that until the Industrial Revolution. And since the Industrial Revolution, they've increased rapidly to the point where a couple of years ago we passed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. This is a big deal. This trajectory, as I say, a rapid increase in carbon dioxide concentrations is such that over the last 100 years we've added about 120 parts per million, but it's so rapid now that we fully expect that we'll see something like 600 parts per million before the end of the century, if we're lucky, and could see levels as much as 900 parts per million. You know, twice what we have now, three times what would be natural levels. And the greenhouse effect, the warming effect on the globe, is pretty much directly proportional to those carbon dioxide levels. There are complications to that, but it's pretty much a direct proportionality. So my next couple of questions have to do with the future and what your climate change projections tell us about what may be next for tribal reservations in the Southwest. For listeners who are interested in taking a look at some of these projections, which consist of projections for temperature and precipitation for a selected group of tribal reservations in our study area through the year 2100, they're available on our website at nativewaters-airedlands.com, both as graphs and raw data. Mike, could you tell us a little bit about how you make these projections? What kind of data and information you work with? In my work, I work with a couple of kinds of climate information. I work with historical data and I work with climate projections. The historical data is often records that have come from weather stations with thermometer sitting, you know, hanging in a little white box somewhere to protect it from the sunshine. Although for this project, as often as not, because we're working with a very diverse and widespread set of locations around the southwest, I tend to actually work more with gridded data, which is data where we've taken those observation points and interpolated between them to fill out our best guess as to what the temperatures were, what the precipitation was in grid boxes that cover the entire southwest. And what kind of climate models do you use to make the projections? The climate projections we get from climate models. So there are these global climate models that are really a synthesis of all we know about the fluid dynamics of the atmosphere, about the connections between the atmosphere and the ocean and the atmosphere and the land surfaces, as well as processes like cloud formation and precipitation and radiation, how radiation gets into and back out of the atmosphere, all those things. You put all of that science, all that physics, frankly, into a model of the Earth system, atmosphere, ocean, lands, and you can step forward through time and make uh, simulations of how the climate might unfold over the next day or so, that's a weather model, to the next hundred years, that's a climate model. For this project, I went out and got outputs from 15 different climate models, each run with both of two greenhouse gas emissions scenarios for the future. The 15 models are a sampling from what it amounts to about 30 some odd models that are actually out there that different groups around the world have put together. We chose 15 on the basis of some studies that looked at how well each of these models produced the statistics of climate during the historical period. Some of the climate models that are out there really, frankly, stink when it comes to getting even the average temperature of the globe right. And the ones that really do a poor job in terms of getting the global climate statistics right, we figure 
probably aren't ones that we want to hang our hats on very much, and so we toss them out. Then these studies went in and looked at how well each of the models reproduced the long-term climate statistics over the western U.S., and that tossed out several more. What that gets us is not so much that we know which are the best models, but we have identified the models that really are the worst, and we've gotten rid of the worst ones, and now we've got a collection of 15 different climate models that we pay attention to when we're working at the scale of the tribes scattered around the southwest. Those 15 models, when we put them all together, as I said, we don't know which one is best, and so we don't throw any of those out. Number one, it prevents us from being fooled by any individual model. We look at them all at once, but it also gives us a sense of the range of possibilities into the future. We don't know which one's best. We don't know whether any of them are that great, but taken together, they provide what amounts to an envelope of of what the likely coolest future would be, or the likely warmest future would be, what the likely driest future might be, what the likely wettest future might be. So you've put together climate projections for 10 different tribes located in the Native Water Study Area, including the Colorado River tribes, Duck Valley, Duckwater, Gila River, Hopi, Navajo, Pyramid Lake Paiute, Uinta and Ore, Walker Lake, and Zuni Reservations. Can you give us an example of what the projections tell us about one of those reservations? When we look at the projections for a place like Duck Valley, which is up at the northernmost central Nevada, right on the Idaho border, what we end up with is a scattering of possible future temperatures. Historically, the temperatures tend to stay between about 6 and 8 degrees centigrade. That's during the uh, last half of the 20th century. By the end of the 21st century, the range is anywhere from 8 degrees to 16 degrees centigrade. And if you think about that, that means that the very warmest years that we see historically are going to be as warm as the coolest years that we can project into the future and by the end of the 21st century. In terms of precipitation, the story isn't quite as clear what we get is a broad range of annual precipitation totals in the historical period and a broad range of precipitation totals in the future. The average precipitation values increase slightly for a place like Duck Valley up to the north. They decrease slightly for a place like the Gila River Reservation down in southern Arizona. But for most of the southwest, it's hard to even say whether they're increasing or decreasing on average. But the one thing that we do know about the precipitation that we have extracted is that although the averages only change a slight amount in the long haul in these projections, the extremes of precipitation increase dramatically in many of these areas. In most of these areas, frankly, we see deeper droughts and wetter, very wet years. And so that the picture of the future is one that is warmer, such that the coolest temperatures by 2100 are likely to be as warm as or warmer than the warmest temperatures that we've seen historically. The precipitation totals for each year don't change that much, but what we are projecting in the future is a situation where we're increasingly buffeted from very wet to very dry and back again uh, in ways that are even more extreme than what we have historically. And the Southwest is known historically for how rapidly we can switch between a wet year and a dry year. You mentioned that your projections for these reservations show two different emission scenarios. What's the difference between the two scenarios and why do we look at two? So just as we can't really know at this point which of the many and literally dozens of climate models that people have put together around the world uh, is the right one, we have other uncertainties when we try and do these projections into the future. The uncertainties about which models might be getting it righter than others are large. 
but they're really, frankly, dwarfed by the uncertainty we have about what people will do in the future. If we continue on the path that we're on with economic development, both at home and, and around the world, continuing to grow ever more rapidly, then we end up in a situation where the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, as I said, might be triple or more what they are under natural conditions. That's a scenario that we don't want to go down, but it's one that we have to take very seriously. Another alternative that climate scientists end up considering is the scenario where at some point in the not very distant future, the societies of the world decide that it's time to get control of climate change and we start reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We have a scenario that we tend to look at that is one where by the end of the 21st century, um, 80 years from now, the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere have leveled off. That one brings us to a, about a doubling of the natural greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere by end of century, but they stay there. These two emission scenarios that are described, the one where we continue business as usual and the other one where we get our act together and level off the emissions, are they're sufficiently different that they make a bigger difference than which of the many climate models you look at. I mentioned that for Duck Valley, the temperatures by 2100, the projections can range with to a point where annual temperatures could be anywhere between about 8 and 16 degrees centigrade. That's including both of those emission scenarios. If we knock it down and say, oh, we're going to definitely get on one of these emission scenarios, then it's a difference if we continue business as usual, accelerating greenhouse gas emissions. The annual temperatures at Duck Valley end up ranging between about 12 and 16 degrees. If we're on the greener emissions path where we level off our emissions, then the temperatures at Duck Valley might range between about 8 degrees and 12 degrees, recalling that 8 degrees is pretty much the warmest temperatures that we see there now. What kind of trends is the Southwest already experiencing when it comes to changes in climate? So. After World War II, the global economy really took off, not only in the developed world, but in the developing world. There's been an immense amount of economic growth and an immense amount of uh, burning of fossil fuels and the like. And the situation is such that historically there was a gradual increase in the greenhouse gases, gradual by 20th century standards extreme compared to the longer paleo history. What we saw was a gradual increase from the Industrial Revolution through about the 1960s. But since then, the greenhouse effect associated with our emissions has increased by about eight times as fast. The consequence of that is that most of the climate changes that we've already seen show up in the past 50 years, since about 1970. Prior to that, there were increases in temperature and that sort of thing. But for the most part, at a regional scale, they were muted compared to what we've seen more recently. Over the past 50 years, we've seen the temperatures rise by about a degree C, which again doesn't sound like much, but it's enough such that we've also seen our snowpacks already are declining in some areas very rapidly. We're seeing the date of the onset of spring measured by when the snow melts, by when the plants green up, by all those sorts of measures is now a couple weeks earlier than it was in 1950s, 1970s. We're starting to see the plants and animals migrating towards cooler conditions. For the most part to date, we haven't seen large long-term precipitation changes that stand up to the test of really being able to reproduce them regardless of how you do the analysis. But that's actually to be expected given what we've seen in the projections, which is that the long-term precipitation values don't change that much compared to the year-to-year -year variations. 
it's hard to look at the historical records from places around the Southwest without a sneaking suspicion that the amount of variation from year to year, the, the range of wet year to dry year variations in the historical record has increased in recent decades. I would argue that that's a very hard thing to measure and to document that that's not just random chance. And so I think that, you know, we have to be a little bit skeptical of conclusions that the year-to-year -year variation in precipitation has increased greatly already. But looking at the historical record, it's actually very easy to convince yourself that, that something like that is going on. We've seen these really major droughts. We've seen these very wet periods. Some of our wettest periods in many parts of the Southwest have happened in the past 50 years, past 30 years, past 20 years, depending on, you know, which, where you're looking. And those are the kinds of changes that we're already seeing. When I talk about this, I like to make the point that the way that we detect those changes depends on a whole range of data that get collected, stream gauges and weather stations and snow pillows and bird surveys and all that sort of thing. And the situation right now is that over the past 50 years, we see changes that are consistent, that are predictable from climate change and what we expect will happen with the increases of greenhouse gases that we've seen already. We're seeing these changes in literally about a dozen different regional scale uh, observation networks operated by different agencies with different instruments measuring completely different things and they're all pointing towards these changes that are already going on. To date, the changes that can be documented as you know, long-term trends and consistent with climate change tend to be associated with the warming that's already begun and that we're already seeing. You know, the lack of snowpack or the earlier melt of snowpack, those sorts of things are warming signals, not so much precipitation signals. But the changes are already underway. Uh, our projections in the, to the future are that they will continue and that they will actually probably accelerate with time as we push past these temperature thresholds and ultimately as precipitation changes really settle in and become a big deal. Mike, do you have any takeaway messages for tribes located in our study area? So where this all comes down is that in the distant past, before Europeans came on the landscape, the tribes of the Southwest were already encountering mega droughts and mega wet periods. And there were long, long-term fluctuations in the temperatures such that 8,000 years ago, the temperatures were warm enough to be comparable to what we probably see today. The tribes got through all of that kind of variability. And so the issue that comes up is how do those long past climate variations compare to what we're projecting now over the course of the next century and beyond? And the a second question is, is that a fair comparison between the two? Today, we're already at a very warm state for the Southwest. We're expecting another several degrees at least of warming before the end of the century. And that's going to take us well beyond the historical temperatures that any tribe on this landscape has ever encountered. For precipitation, there are those mega droughts out there in the paleo record. We really don't project in any consistent way that those will happen or increase. There are some studies that suggest they'll increase, but in large part, that increase is more a measure of how the warming will affect things, how much additional evaporation and the like will bear down and take away from whatever precipitation falls. So taken as a whole, the temperature increases are something that we haven't encountered. The precipitation increases or decreases so far seem to fall within the range of things that have occurred in the Southwest over the past couple thousand years. More generally, the differences between the past climate changes and future climate changes 
are that in terms of climate change in the future, we know it's coming. The climate changes that we're projecting are basic physics and we know that they're coming and we know that actually we have our hands on the tiller in terms of how bad they get. If we continue to row our emissions the way that we have for the past 50 years, they will be very bad indeed. If we level off, if we get our emissions under control, things will still not be great, but we'll be in a better position. So that the big distinction is that we actually have control. But when I say we there, I mean globally. It's something that local folks can contribute to, but boy, it's going to take a global decision to get the climate change uh, off of the fast track onto a more reasonable future. One of the points that's been brought up every time I've talked to the tribal representatives on this project is the other distinction between the paleo condition and, and the projected future. And that is that in the paleo past, the tribes were in a position to move out of the impact zone for some of these major droughts and the like, or to disperse, to, to move to one side, to change their way of life in many cases. And that's a major concern because today the tribes, their lands are very restricted plots of land in many cases and the options for just picking up and moving away are much less. So even though tribes have weathered mega droughts in the past, it's not obvious that they could weather the same droughts with even as much of them as they did the past ones. Um, now that, that social and legal constraints on land ownership, that sort of stuff have changed. Great. Well, Mike, thank you so much for being here with us today and telling us a little bit about your work. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you guys. Funding for Native Waters on Aired Lands is provided by the United States Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Music for this podcast came from Poddington Bear and the Free Music Archive. If you'd like to learn more about the Native Waters on Aired Lands project, please visit our website at nativewaters-airedlands.com, where you can find more episodes of this podcast and also supplemental information to go along with each episode. Thanks for listening.